My beloved sisters and brothers in Christ, my sisters and brothers of the Susquehanna Conference, it's been eight years and it's still true. I love you all. (laughs) In these days of holy conferencing, it is my prayer that we will hear God's truth And we will be bold to speak God's truth. It is my prayer that we will be bold as we anticipate living into God's future for us. And it is my prayer that when we leave this place, we will be inspired anew to, and say it with me, make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. What a privilege it is to gather in holy conferencing, to be in one another's presence and to be in God's presence, to recognize God's spirit here in our midst. Can't you feel it? To be challenged, to hear hear truths that we may find uncomfortable, even disarming, and to be inspired anew to be the church, to truly be the church. We, as United Methodists, are a people of conferencing. We follow in the footsteps of John Wesley. This is the account in his journal. In June 1744, I desired my brother and a few other clergymen to meet me in London to consider how we should proceed to save our own souls and those that hurt us. After some time, I invited lay preachers that that were in the house to meet with us. We conferred together for several days and were much comforted and strengthened thereby. The next year, I not only invited most of the traveling preachers, but several others to confirm it with me in Bristol. This I did for many years, and all that time, the term conference meant not so much the conversations we had together as the persons who conferred. Conference meant not so much the conversations we had together as the persons who conferred. You know, the power of Christ coming in the form of human as God with us, Emmanuel, God with us, is acknowledging the power that we have person to person, face to face, and more profoundly when the Christ in me meets the Christ in you. And the Christ in you meets the Christ in me. And something happens that is more than the sum total of the two of us, or the three of us, or the 1,300 or 1,400 of us. Christ with us. That's the promise of conferencing. That's what holy conferencing is about in its best sense. And so we are blessed. We are so blessed. But we're not here to just talk about how blessed we are. We're also here to talk about how we're challenged today. And so how are we challenged today? We know that in the United Methodist Church, as in other mainline churches, we continue to lose members. In fact, the last year that the church United, that the Methodist Church grew. Do you know what it was? What do you think? Guesses. A little bit. 62. 1962, which would be what? 50 years ago. But we aren't alone in this drop in participation. For the last 10 years, many of the mega churches and conservative churches that have grown recently have been have stopped growing as well. In a survey taken 52 years ago in 1960, 
97% of respondents were emphatic about the existence of God. When the same survey, survey was done in 2009, the percentage of Americans who claimed a strong belief in God was 71%. That's a 26% drop. The category of religious belief that is growing the most rapidly is the nuns. That is the N-O-N-E-S. We know that some 50% of the people in our communities have no faith home, and in some communities it's even higher. The more alarming statistic is that only 25 to 30% of adults adults under 30 claim any religious affiliation. That is our world today, friends, a far cry from the 50s and the 60s. And yet, and yet, there is a deep and growing spiritual hunger in our society today. In 1962, pollsters found that 22% of Americans claim to have had a mystical experience of God. In 1976, that number had risen to 31%. In 2009, 48% of Americans claimed to have had a mystical experience of God. Half, Half of the people have made that claim. Diana Butler Bass, in her book, Christianity After Religion, and that book is subtitled, The End of Church and Birth of a New Spiritual Awakening, points out that people are hungering, hungering for meaning in their lives. And I might add, often looking in all the wrong places. It is a faith community, I believe, that has the potential and indeed the capacity to speak to that deep spiritual hunger. We can do this. This is our opportunity to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ in such a way that people come to understand that the deep spiritual hunger they have will be fed by an encounter with Jesus. But for too many of our churches, the time may be past to be willing to learn to speak a language which can communicate with that deep longing for God. The time may be past to become a thriving, vital congregation which is truly speaking to that hunger for meaning. Let's look at Melrose United Methodist Church. I'm Marcy Strode. I was a member here at the former Melrose United Methodist Church until its final service here. I believe it was June 13th of 2011, uh, and then acted kind of as a conservator until the church was recently sold. The church started in 1888 on this site in a tent. Uh, It was started by the Reverend Nathan Skerritt, who was originally a circuit rider for the Methodist Church. This is the new sanctuary. It was built in 1929. Just took my breath away from the moment I first walked into it and continues every time I walk into it. At its heyday, while the church would be full, I think probably 600 people, it was known as the rich white people's church. And it really was, but the neighborhood had changed. A lot more immigrants. This neighborhood is a melting pot. We have so many needs. Single parenthood, poverty is a big one. At different times, people had mentioned things that would have been so helpful that never got put into place. And it it makes me sad that opportunities were missed years and years ago. We just kind of spun our wheels a lot. We didn't have the money to get programmed. The building was a drain. We just kind of hemorrhaged members. The church that that bought us, uh, they're giving themselves a new name with the move to the new church. It's going to be New Beginnings Apostolic Church, hopefully. It's going to be a congregation that will meet the needs of the neighborhood. I still have keys to the church. And I'm going to, when I finish the last few odds and ends of the things I have to do here, I'll leave them on the pastor's desk. 
come in and have a big cry and then walk out. The story of this congregation in Kansas City is not unique. Some of you have faced this same sad time. But others of you have, who have, have taken bold steps into a new future. Watson Town, a few years ago, made the commitment to move out of their aging building, to say goodbye to the church building that held many memories but no longer suited their needs. They've moved to a beautiful site outside of town, at the edge of town, and, and a building that's fully accessible and already packed with children and youth, housing a Christian day, daycare program and a vital congregation which has received 25 new members this year, including a confirmation class of 15. It wasn't easy to do this, but they took that bold step. Cross Point in Harrisburg has a vision of multiplying their ministry, and so they've added two campuses to their ministry, one of which is the Perking Point. It's actually a coffee shop in a strip mall where there's so much vitality. I was able to worship with them not long ago, and I, I uh, asked the people who were there. It was, it was packed with worshipers, and I asked them, several of them, how did you get here? And everyone said, my friend invited me, my neighbor invited me. It's a place that people are eager to share with their neighbors. And then Carlisle in downtown Three downtown churches got together, what, 18 months ago, two years ago, something like that, in order to vision for their future, in order to determine what is the vision that they held. Where was was it that God was leading them, listening closely to God and working together, and it emerged that what they needed to do was unify, come together, and the miracle is that all three congregations voted overwhelmingly to take this awesome step. So does that mean that the only way forward is a new building or a merger or the -the out-of-the-box idea of meeting in a coffee shop? Not at all. Not at all. But what it's telling us is that Vitality requires a willingness to go where you haven't gone before. A willingness to take risks. When God has called God's people to leave something precious behind, it is always replaced by a new experience of faith, which is far more glorious than they could have ever imagined. So now where are we today as a Susquehanna Conference? As we look at our composite figures as a conference for 2011, like most of the conferences in the United Methodist Church, we have continued a decline in membership. In 2011, we had a loss of 2% in membership. In worship attendance, a loss of 2%, which, by the way, isn't quite as high as we've been some other years. And number of professions of faith, a loss of 3% last year. But I want to share with you the good news These are signs which I believe are pointing to a foundation for the future of the churches of our conference. We had a 37% increase in the number of constituents. That is, persons who are participants in the church but not yet members. To put this in numbers, we lost, as a a conference, 4,000 in membership. But the number of constituents increased by almost 12,000. That is a phenomenal growth. And it's consistent with what we're learning today. People are no longer joining. Some of you might remember the book that came out in 1995, Bowling Alone by Robert Putnam. Some of you know of that book. In it, he noted that there were actually more people bowling, but there were fewer leagues. And that was true across, uh, kind of across the spectrum. You know that civic organizations are trying desperately for members. People aren't joining, but they will participate, and we see that. 
we also had an increase in various learning groups in our congregations, ranging from an increase of 4% to 11%. These groups included children, young adults, other adults, covenant discipleship groups, and short-term classes. This tells me that we are becoming more intentional about making disciples. Equally exciting to me is the increase in outreach to our communities and beyond. And these are amazing statistics, I think. VIM teams, a 17% increase. Number of persons in VIM teams, a 15% increase. Other mission teams, a 28% increase. And number of persons in these these teams, 34% increase. These are very encouraging numbers. When we look at persons served by community ministry, the news is even more amazing. We had a 39% increase in persons served by our congregations for a total of 332,000 people. Now look at those figures. We've more than doubled where we were in 2009 in just two years. And then the number of community ministries for outreach, justice, mercy had a 185% increase. Now, here's what I'm trying to say, friends. What is it? What is our mission? To make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. We are partnering with God and more intentional about transforming the world. We are living our mission. We are living our mission. Woohoo! We need to celebrate this kind of news, friends. Something very exciting and real is happening in our churches. As we're understanding that the church isn't merely about what happens within the walls of the, of the church. But the church is what happens when we take the good news of Jesus Christ into our communities and into the lives of people. A challenge we face, though, is resetting our finances as a conference. I've convened a financial summit bringing all the people all the entities in our conference that have something to do with finances at one table. In the proposed reorganization plan that you'll be looking at on Friday, we intend to have these kind of consultations on a regular basis. You see, as a conference, we can't just operate in silos. We can't operate in our own little world, but we need to be talking with one another and working with one another. For 14 years, the former Central Pennsylvania Conference supported general church apportionments at 100%. For 14 years, we did that. In the past two years, we've fallen short. In addition, some of our churches have failed to even support their insurance obligations. Failure to do this, my friends, means that you who are not fully funding your shares of ministry and other obligations are now relying on the 69% of churches who did pay 100% of their shares of ministry. It also means that as a conference, we are now relying on the other conferences who fully pay their apportionments. This can't be the Susquehanna Conference way. Our cabinet has worked to right-size appointments. So some of you are now in configurations that you haven't been in before, and that's to help you be in a situation where you can adequately fund your ministry without stretching to an impossible extent. The real difference will come, though, my friends, when we restore vitality to all of our congregations. The Council of Bishops has challenged us with a call to action. We have a mandate to spread the good news of Jesus Christ, and God is with us on this journey. 
We're facing many challenges as a church. But the promise is, God is with us. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I've called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Our reality is this. Disciples are not made at the district level. And disciples are not made at the conference level. And disciples are not made at the general church level. Disciples are made at the local church. Disciples are made when a neighbor offers to bring a neighbor to church, which is how Jack and I wound up as as United Methodists. When a nurse shares with another nurse the transformation she's experienced through her local church, when a truck driver tells his customer how he's discovered Jesus. When a youth brings a lonely friend to MYF, I do confirmation events. And I often ask those who have gathered there, how many of you are here because your friend brought you to church? And always hands go up. Disciples are made when we reach out to others with our testimony of the power and presence of Jesus in our lives by words and actions. Disciples are made when almost 100 youth spend a week every summer in York repairing homes, cleaning parks, tending community gardens, and making a statement of Christ's presence in that community. Last summer, the cabinet joined these teams for a week. I was on a team with four teens who spent days reconstructing a porch in the small house of Nadine and the four generations of her family who lived there. Each day as we worked on that porch, little Solomon, four years old, and his friend Jamal stood inside on the locked screen door looking out and chatting with the teens about what they were doing and they sure would like to be doing that and why they were doing it and so forth. And and finally, the porch was finished. We had a great celebration and everybody came out on the porch and little Solomon was jumping up and down and he said, when I get big... I want us to build porches and help peoples. This is how the disciples are made. This past year, some of you had experienced a devastating flood. And others of you responded. And so team after team is headed to the flood-torn sections of this conference. But that's not the whole story that I want to share with you. We received a $50,000 check from the Mississippi Conference. And with it, a note from Bishop Hope Morgan Ward, who said, Pennsylvania sent more people to help us recover from Katrina than any other conference. And we want to help you out. Several strategies were proposed at General Conference. Some of you I know followed it with streaming and in other ways. The idea was they would, these strategies would shift the priorities of the General Conference to providing increased resources for local churches. And in a sense, despite what didn't happen at General Conference, that will happen because the General Conference budget was reduced dramatically in order to funnel more money at the local level. But what we do know is that the vitality of the local church is at the heart of United Methodism. So what is it that makes the church vital? We want to begin to pay particular attention to some of those markers that make a church vital. Indicators of vital congregations. One is worship. Who's there? How many are there? Is it vital? Is worship exciting? Is it joy-filled? Is it challenging? Is it filling people's souls? How many professions of faith? 
That's the lifeblood of a church. Those who are coming to know Jesus Christ. And you know in your own churches, when people come, it gives everyone new energy. And certainly it feeds their heart. Small groups, we know that that's where disciples are made. When we're in small groups and we can be challenged and we can challenge others and we can together share the word and other resources for for living the Christian life. Persons involved in mission, how many, are you going out? Are you getting outside the walls of your church? And money given to mission, including to shares of ministry. As a conference, we're working mightily to reposition ourselves, to resource you in your churches in more significant ways. Last year, you approved by a very dramatic majority, I think around 95%, the creation of seven districts. This new district configuration will allow us to revision the way superintendents work. Assisting elders have been named to work with superintendents in ways that will free the DSs to do visioning and leadership development, new congregation creation and vitalization. One of the most promising of our plans for this new work is the creation of the position of director of congregational development. That position will be filled by Dennis Otto, who, when he was a pastor of First Williamsport, saw a tripling of worship attendance. We're committed to doing everything possible to assist you in that kind of vitality. And we are committed, to, in addition, to creating new places for new people. In the year 2010, in the United States, there were more births of racial ethnic babies than non-Hispanic white babies. Yet in our conference, our percentage of Asian, African American, Hispanic, Native American, and Pacific Islander combined, combined together is a tiny, tiny fraction of our... Look around, friends. We're mighty white. <laughs> if we're truly going to be God's whole people... In every sense, we must include all of God's people. Can I have an amen on that? We must make a unified commitment to plant new churches for new people. Conferences which are growing are doing so because of their willingness to sacrifice in order to provide churches for all people, in order to plant new churches, in order to multiply ourselves. And all that we do has to be based on our core values of who we are. We're thinking about it in this way. We are unbound. We're unbound from all that limits our connection to God. We're unbound in taking bold, agile steps of faith. We're unbound in, a, in now having an intentional inclusiveness of all God's people. And we're unbound in, having, in participating in transformational worship in all that we do. And we're outbound in ministry to those yet to come to the church, in service to the least and forgotten. We're outbound in responsible stewardship of all of our resources, And in our discernment of God's leading in all that we do. And most of all, we are Christ-bound. We are Christ-bound in all that we do. These are our core values. This is who we are. What we're now looking at is, how do we operate as a conference? Can we improve that? You've received information about reorganizational proposal of our life together as a conference. It's a way to simplify our life together in order to fully, more fully live out our mission. If this plan is approved by you, our conference structure will be leaner and more nimble and can more fully focus our energies as a conference on the local church. We're still a new conference, aren't we? This is the third session of the Susquehanna Annual Conference. This is a time to allow God's spirit to shape us, mold us, shift us, and move us forward. 
an unfrozen time. The challenge is clear. Ursula Burns began her career with Xerox as an intern in 1980, and she rose through the ranks to become the CEO, the first African-American woman to lead a Fortune 500 company. Now, when you think of Xerox, what do you think of? Copies, right? Copies. In fact, sometimes you might say, well, I'll Xerox this. It's that identified with the name. But in an increasingly paperless world, a business based on copies will fail. Yet the core values of Xerox are focused on information. And this business is thriving. Why? Because they were willing to go beyond the machine. If you have an easy pass and you have any dealings with an easy pass, you're dealing with Xerox. In some communities, if you get a speeding ticket, you'll be dealing with Xerox. (laughs) And I don't think they take bribes. Ms. Burns said in a recent interview, the world is changing. If you don't transform your company, you're stuck. Could we put church in there? She went on to say, we must become relevant as the world is transformed and we ourselves are transforming. Earlier, I shared with you rather grim news about religious life in America. Diana Butler Bass believes that we are in the midst of a religious awakening. In an awakening, she says, we actually wake up and see ourselves, our neighbors, and our world from a different perspective. Jesus is calling us to wake up. Jesus is calling us to a change of heart. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. As the church, as God's church, as God's people called United Methodist, it's time for us to repent in the deepest sense of that word. The Greek word is metanoia, which literally is translated, turn around. Make a shift. Make a dramatic shift. We can't shrink from the hard work of growing our spirits in order to grow the church. Nor can we shrink from growing in love and service of Jesus. Growing as disciples has to be at the very core of who we are. Every one of us must be on a journey of growing as a disciple of Jesus Christ. I'm just wondering, will I ever get there? (laughs) Even more important, it's that powerful connection with Jesus, which we can offer to others who are longing for a life that is richer, fuller, and of value. My friends, we can organize and strategize all we want. We can restructure. But unless all of this is founded on an ever-depending relationship with Jesus Christ, unless we are committed to growing our faith and offering that deep faith experience to others, we indeed are a clanging symbol. There's no shortcut here. We need to immerse ourselves in the scripture, studying the Bible as if we're fresh, as if we're reading it new for the first time. That's why I love to go to Peterson's translation, The Message, or or the new contemporary English version. Sometimes reading those, those translations brings a new wrinkle on those words that are almost too familiar. We need to read it with new eyes. When, and when you read, you need to ask always, where is God's spirit in this? Where do I sense God yearning for me, for the church? And we need to be serious about engaging in the practices of faith, meditation and prayer. We need to also engage in our outer practice of faith, service, hospitality, reaching out to our neighbor near and far. 
volunteering at a community center, participating in missions, working with children. Remember, John Wesley challenged us to scriptural holiness and social holiness. Finally, we need to have fun. You know, this isn't all dreary. As a matter of fact, we need to have fun. We need to kick up our heels and celebrate and play. <laughs> Laugh, joy, rejoice, play with children. Let your worship life and your church life be joyful. It's good news we're preaching here. Remember that? Be like the laughing Jesus. Jesus Christ is the hope of the world. And keeping your eyes on Christ will bear fruit. In Luke 9, according to the message, Jesus called the disciples together and gave them authority and power to deal with all the demons and to cure diseases. And then he sent them out to preach the good news, as we heard before, and to heal with these instructions. Don't load yourself up with equipment. Keep it simple. You are the equipment. Say it with me. You are the equipment. If we are faithful to this message, we will bring hope to the world and the church will thrive. Like the disciples who were sent out, you are indeed the equipment. We're sent out into unfamiliar territory where no one has gone before. We must blaze new trails, find a new course for this extraordinary river of God. We must be willing to do the impossible, the risky, the untried, whether others join or not. And of this we can be certain. Because of our courage, because of our willingness to go where God leads, others will draw strength and will follow. Here's what we read in Romans 8, according to Peterson's message translation. This resurrection life you receive from God is not a timid, grave-tending life. It's adventurously expectant. Greeting God with a childlike, what's next, Papa? And those words from Isaiah we need to carve into our hearts. Don't be afraid. I've redeemed you. I've called your name, your mine. When you're in over your head, I'll be there with you. When you're in rough waters, you will not go down. When you're between between a rock and a hard place, it won't be a dead end. Because I am God, your personal God, the Holy of Israel, your Savior. God's river indeed flows in us. It flows as strongly as our life's blood. And God is with us. Thanks be to God.